Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed another day that you have made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your prophets, those in the past, those that live among us now, and those that will live in the future. We thank you, Father, for their, um, their work of communicating what you have to say to us. Father, we are blessed by the study of the book of Zechariah. And so we pray, Father, that once again, you show us what's in this word. Anoint our ears to hear this word proclaimed today. And anoint our hearts all to receive it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, it's good to be here. It's good to be with you, and it's good to be in God's presence. It's just good to be here. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we have been studying the book of Zechariah, and I just really have been blessed by it. Uh, I've just never spent this much time in this particular book. You know, the Lord had put it on my mind to study, and I just think that it's a good time to do this. Zechariah 10, remember, Zechariah is after, or it's after the exile. The people are back in the promised land. At least some of them are. Okay, some of them. The ones who were in Babylonian captivity, those are the ones who are now back. Uh, so this is after the exile. And when you hear what is being said, uh, it's important for us to know where we are in the history of God's people for it to make any sense to us. So, Zechariah 10, God says through his prophet, he said, Ask rain from the Lord at the time of the spring rain, uh, the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain, vegetation in the field, to each man. So, uh, he is just saying, ask. Ask for what you need. Ask for the rain. I mean, that's one of the things we better be asking for here. Because we haven't had good crops in a long time. And so we want the clouds to break forth, not in floods, but in just the right amount so that the, um, the, the seeds will begin to sprout and we will get the vegetation that we are looking for and the vegetables and those sorts of things. It says here, and he will give them showers of rain, vegetation in the field to each man. When you hear, the, when I hear at least, the word he will, I start immediately thinking about all of the I wills of God. Well, this particular chapter is packed with what God will do. In fact, I counted 13 of them. 13 of them. Now, I could run through them real quick, but I'm not going to do that because, you know, y'all are going to go, wait, wait, wait. We don't want to do that. So, but just to let you know, there are 13 of them. Either he will, God will, I will. And so it's just in here as to what the Lord will do for his people. Verse 2. For the teraphim speak iniquity, and the diviners see a lie and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Now we're going to stop right there. No, go, keep going further. Therefore the people journey like sheep. They are afflicted because they have no shepherd. And we go, okay, first of all, the teraphim. What is a teraphim? The teraphim were the household gods or the idols that people kept in their homes. Okay? So, for the household gods, the idols that, they, that you keep in your home, they speak iniquity, and the diviners see a lie, and they tell false dreams, they comfort in vain. Isn't it interesting that the reason people are resorting to these idols is because there's no godly leadership? What's even more interesting is this is after the exile. Uh, and you sit there and you go, again? Again, people, again, you're going to be going back to this stuff that got you into exile to begin with? Yes, we never learn. And so, you know, they were just going back to it. But he says they speak lies. Uh, they speak iniquity or futility. They tell false dreams. The whole idea is they want to comfort people, but they're comforting them in vain because they're not giving any information from the Lord, and the reason for this is they don't have a shepherd. They don't have leaders 
who are leading the people in godly ways. Remember, as go the leaders, so go the people typically. That's typically how it works. Hey, if my leaders are doing this, it must be okay. If our leader is going to be lawless, let's be lawless too. Okay? That's typically the way it works. You know, if our leaders don't have any kind of respect for the law, why should we? So, but that's what it was. You know, these, these people were seeking spiritual direction and guidance from idols. But that was strictly forbidden, right? First commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, the beginning of the commandment says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generation of them who hate me and showing mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods, because he's a jealous God. He jealously loves us. And he doesn't want anything to get in between us and him and his love for us. So, these people, because they were lacking godly leadership, they were turning to these other gods, which we know are not gods. They are devils, demons, unclean, unholy spirits, spirits of wickedness. It's the devil that's empowering these things uh, to have anything to say, so to speak, to these people. Well, of course, the devil's not going to be giving godly advice. He's going to be giving unholy, ungodly advice. Uh, and the people just aren't going to be walking in God's way. But that's what the people had turned to because they didn't have godly leadership. So what does God say in verse 3? He says, my anger is kindled against the shepherds. And I will punish the male goats. And it's like, what? Okay, I actually looked up all of the male goat things in the Bible. And uh, I'm I so, so thankful for resources, particularly on the computer. You just click and you go, go down the thing and just say, okay, here they are. And male goats is just a euphemism for leaders, okay? So I will punish the leaders. His anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will, another one of the I wills, I will punish the leaders. What's interesting is God really... He warns people about not eagerly becoming teachers. James chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, because the teachers are going to be judged more strictly than anybody else. Y'all are probably all sitting there thinking, Thank you, Pastor Kathleen. <laughs> but yeah, not many of you should become leaders, because leaders are going to be our teachers, because we get tr judged more strictly. Why is God going to do that? Because he, they, weren't, they weren't leading the people in God's ways. They weren't leading the people in God's ways. Uh, and so God says, I'm going to, my, my anger is kindled against these people, and I will punish them. I will punish them. And then he says, for the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah. Now, in this particular passage, he is, he is distinguishing between Judah and Ephraim, Judah and Israel, uh, Judah and Joseph. And, uh, and so right now he's just talking about the house of Judah. And so he says, The Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic horse in battle. Now isn't that kind of a cool description? Because these people had come from Babylonian captivity. I mean, they probably feel pretty downtrodden because of what they had been through. God is saying to them, hey, I am going to make you, I will make them like my majestic horse in battle. Man, that had to have just gone, wow, that's, that's just empowering to say we're not going to be oppressed. We're not going to be downtrodden uh, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord is coming to his people. He makes a wonderful promise to them, and he will hold on to it. Verse 4. From him will come, this verse has four from hims. From him will come the cornerstone. From the Lord will come the cornerstone. We know that's Jesus. From him will come the tent peg. What's a tent peg? Well, it holds the tent down. Yesterday I was working in the garden beds that we're making over where I live. I had this bright idea the day before to put up canopies. 
so I could work out there longer, not be beat on, you know, by the sun, and had tent pegs in the ground. But at times there were these gusts of winds that I had to hold the tent down. <laughs> I was like, going, whoa. I was like, come on, calm down here, calm down here. They hold the tent in place. And so he's saying, from him, from him, he's going to bring about that thing that's going to hold Judah in place, his people. From him will come the bow of battle. Instead of people thinking, I've got to equip myself for this battle, he says, I'm going to give you the bow. It's going to come from me. I am the source of this. And then he says, from him, every ruler, all of them together, from him. People are not going to take on this responsibility for themselves. That's how people generally get in trouble when they think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. And he says, I am going to give them every ruler. I will do it. I will, I will, I will. And then he says, of all these people, he says, they will be as mighty men treading down the enemy in the mire of the streets in battle. And they will fight. For the Lord will be with them. And the riders on horses will be put to shame. In other words, Judah's enemies will be put to shame. They think they are tough stuff because they've got horses and you know, all kinds of strong, in human terms, weapons of war. But he says the riders on horses will be put to shame. Why? Because the Lord is going to be fighting for his people. He will be with them. Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 6, another bunch of I wills. I will strengthen the house of Judah. And I will save the house of Joseph. And I will bring them back. At this point, Israel, the northern ten tribes, they had not been brought back from captivity. They were, they were taken into captivity in 721-723 B.C. Uh, by Assyria. And, uh, and, and most of the prof prophetic works in the scriptures are written through Judah's prophets, not Israel's. And so uh, a lot of them kind of got lost for a time. But God says here, I will bring them back. Why is he going to bring them back? He says, because I have had compassion on them. And they will be as though, they will be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God and will answer them. Now that's kind of an interesting thing. Had God rejected his people? Yes, for a little while. And he says for a little while. His anger was kindled against them for a little while. So he rejected them for a little while. In fact, God told Jeremiah not to even pray for Judah. Well, that's pretty bad when God says, don't pray for him. Don't pray for him. I'm not going to listen. Don't even pray. In fact, let me just read a couple of these to you from Jeremiah 11:14. So do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer for them for I'm not going to hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble, because of their sin. Jeremiah 7, 16. Therefore do not pray for this people nor lift up a cry of prayer for them nor make intercession to me for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Okay? Um, in Jeremiah 14, verses 10 to 12, thus says the Lord to his people, they, thus they have loved to wander. Not W-O-N-D-E-R, but W-A-N-D-E-R. They like to wander about away from the Lord. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sin. And the Lord said to me, do not pray for this people for their good. Isn't that interesting? When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and grain offering, I will not accept them but I will consume them by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Now that's all before captivity. Okay? Now he is saying, I will bring them back because I have had compassion on them, and they will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am the Lord their God and will answer them. 
You know, for having heard the first thing, I'm not even going to listen. Now he's saying, I will answer them. Why? Because I have had compassion on them. Um, it is uh, the book of Hosea, or I think it's Hosea, where the Lord says that his anger only lasts a moment, but his love and his compassion, his mercy, you know, forever. So, uh, so it's very important for us to know that his anger doesn't last forever. His anger doesn't last forever. Verse 7, Ephraim will be like a mighty man. Again, he's talking about the ten northern tribes. When he talks of Joseph, when he talks of Ephraim, He's talking about those ten northern tribes. Ephraim will be like a mighty man, and their heart will be glad as if from wine. Indeed, their children will see it and be glad. Their heart will rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them to gather them together, for I have redeemed them, and they will be as numerous as they were before. Can you imagine God just whistling for people but can you imagine that the Lord just whistles like, you know, sometimes parents would whistle for their children saying, come on in, it's dark, stop playing outside, dinner's ready. What's interesting about this is that though Judah had returned from captivity, Ephraim had not. Okay, in fact, who knows where they were. But here God promises to bring them back to the land. They were kicked out, he's going to bring them back. What is interesting is when you think about it. Think about when have God's people been flocking back to Israel. 1948 and following. In fact, there were airlifts to bring Jews from all over the world back to Israel. See, I think that this particular, I will whistle for them to gather them together. That's happening in our day. That's being fulfilled now. Uh, now, there, there is a group of people, a group of Jews, that haven't readily, some have, but m many haven't, haven't readily gone back to Israel, and that would be the American Jews. They kind of have it comfortable here. So why move? That's the way it is for most of us. Why move? If you're comfortable, let's just stay right there. So uh, right now, there aren't a lot. I mean, there are certainly some uh, Jews from America who have returned to Israel, but you know, God says here, I will whistle for them. Now, the whistling may not be audible, but the Spirit will pick it up. Our spirits pick up a lot that our hearing doesn't. So God is going to return Ephraim to the land and make them as numerous as they were before the exile. Remember, God's promise to Abraham was that they would be as numerous as the stars of the sky and as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Verse 10, I will bring them back from the land of Egypt. All these I wills. I will gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, and no room can be found for them. In other words, too many. Too many. Oh, we got a lot of people doing the land for peace thing and, and dividing up Israel and shrinking the size of Israel and wanting to get rid of Israel. No, there are going to be so many people there. There's not going to be room enough in the land for them. And he says, and they will pass through the sea of distress. Hmm, that doesn't sound all that great. It gets better, though. And he says, and I will strike the waves of the sea so that all of the depths of the Nile will be dried up and the pride of Assyria will be brought down and the scepter of Egypt will depart. And I will strengthen them in the Lord and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. All of the I wills. He says, I will, you know, he's going to give the showers of rain, vegetation to each man. I will punish the leaders. I will make them like his majestic horse in battle. I will strengthen the house of Judah. I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back to the land. I will answer them. I will whistle for them to gather them together. I will bring them back from the land of Egypt. I will gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon. He will strike the waves of the sea, and I will strengthen them in the Lord. The Lord is, you know, certainly, and of course we all know the Lord is able. And at this point, he's, I am willing. This is what he is going to do. Like I said, I really believe that this is happening in our day. 
And it's happening since Israel has once again become a state. So God is whistling for his people to go home. Or to come home. Yes, he really does want them home. That's his plan. What is interesting, where is it? Oh, I skipped it. Did I skip verse 9? I think I did. Oh, well, let's go back to verse 9. That's very important. Um, He says, When I sow them among the people, they will remember me in far countries, and they with their children will live and come back. There is night and day difference between being sown in a land and being scattered among the nations. One is punishment. Being scattered among the nations is punishment. But for God to say, I will sow them among the peoples, he's saying, I am going to sow you so that you can be a blessing to the nations. I am going to sow you because I want you to reap good fruit for me in the nations. But he, even here he says, he's going to sow them in the other nations, among peoples, and there they will remember the Lord, but even there, he's going to bring, they're going to come, they and their children will come back to the land. That's what he is saying. Big difference between scattering and being sown. Sown, you know, is for good. Scattering, not so much. I just think this is a tremendous passage. And I just had never seen it before. And I always like that when the Lord gives you something that's been there all the time, all the time but you haven't ever seen. It's like, oh, wow, how awesome is this? So, good, good passage about what the Lord is doing in our time in Israel. We've got four more chapters in Zechariah. And uh, we'll just keep working our way through it, see what the Lord is going to show us. And we'll just move on from there. Don't ask me, I don't know what we're doing after that. I know somebody's thinking that. Somebody's thinking it. So don't ask me, because I don't know. So anyway, well, amen. Thank you, Lord, for that wonderful word. And thank you that you are able and willing to do all that you will to do. You know, sometimes we think it's just too fantastic. But you make the impossible possible. Nothing is impossible for you. And even in our day, you are doing much to honor this word and bring it forth to fulfillment. And so we thank you for that. Certainly there are many who are trying to prevent uh, the growing of Israel, the expansion of the number of people that are there. Father, we just pray for your word and will to just keep moving forward in the land of Israel. We pray for your people to hear you whistling for them to come home. But before they even hear the whistle, we pray that those whom you have sown around the world will indeed be a blessing among the peoples to whom you have sent them and sown them among. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.